a PhD candidate from the School of Mechanical Engineering who will present to us um, opportunistic flyby characteristics of asteroids near Earth. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Naomi, and thanks everyone for coming along. Um, pretty excited to be here today. All right, so uh, this is a concept that I've been working on for the past uh, four months, uh, and I can now say that it's prize winning. Uh, it won the Move an Asteroid Prize at the uh, Space Generation Congress, which is held in conjunction with the uh, IAC uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, so pretty stoked about that. And uh, everyone seems to have a company now. I'm also part of a, a fresh new company, just been around one week. Uh, it's called Agile Robotics. Um, so I'd love to talk to people about that if, you, if you'd like to learn more. All right, so there's heaps of asteroids uh, that pass the Earth every year. Does anyone want to field a guess as to how many that might be? Anyone, any guesses? 30. 30, that's a really good guess, actually. Uh, sorry, sorry. I'll, I'll quantify what I mean by near Earth. I mean within one lunar distance. So 30, 500? No, not within one lunar distance. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, do you want to have another guess within one lunar distance? 80. 80? Okay, great. Anyone else? No. All right, I'll uh, go through two slides and uh, we might have a look at how good or how bad that guess might be. Um, but there are asteroids that pass that close, and they, they might not be the biggest one. Uh, the Halloween comet slash asteroid was actually a bit of an outlier. It was about 800 meters across, which is kind of huge, and we kind of only knew about it a few weeks beforehand, um, which we'll see is actually normal. Um, all right, and, and opportunistic. Uh, that word's interesting. So we're, we're taking opportunities as, as they come. So we've got to be ready for these opportunities in order to make this whole system work. I'm not working. Okay, that's cool. All right, so we'll give away the punchline uh, right at the start, and I'll describe this kind of orbital scenario. I'm sorry to the mining guys. I hope this kind of makes sense. Um, so we've got the Earth in the center there, and then we've got a dotted line, which is the Moon's orbit, um, and then we've we've got a holding orbit. So usually when we have spacecraft, we have them hold in a holding pattern. Uh, for a length of time before we send them into an interplanetary trajectory or uh, to the moon as well, um, or even to GSO sometimes. All right, so we've got the, the holding orbit. It's, a, it's around a geosynchronous orbit or maybe a bit bigger, maybe up to 100,000 kilometers height above the Earth. Um, and then we've got this asteroid coming through with the dark blue line there. And the asteroid's orbit's very much out of plane which means that uh, it doesn't matter what your holding orbit's plane is, it doesn't matter how it's inclined to the Earth, um, the asteroid's orbit is going to be probably inclined in a different way again, uh, which can make life tricky, but it actually uh, helps decision, the decision-making pro process as well, which is kind of nice. Uh, so I've got a smiley face there, that's the intercept. You can uh, create an orbit that will intercept the asteroid as it passes through the plane of the initial orbit. And we do that because it decreases the, veloc the delta velocity required, so the change in velocity required um, to move that spacecraft on an uh, intercept trajectory with the asteroid. Um, so I won't explain that. You can, you can ask more about that later, why, why I do that, because uh, it might take a bit too much time. All right, so happily, uh, they intercept at some point. Right, and if, if you're having this intercept kind of orbit, then you must necessarily do just a flyby characterization of these orbits, uh, of these asteroids, sorry. So you can't uh, do what DSI wants to do. You can't sit in orbit or uh, even land on them. You're gonna be flying by, and you're gonna be flying by really fast. We're talking kilometers per second. Um, so all of these asteroids that you see up here, though, they have been characterized by spacecraft flying by at at least 10 kilometers per second relative velocity, which is huge, right? But kind of uh, recently in the last uh, month and a half, some guys have come out and said that maybe, maybe we can uh, tether asteroids that are flying past at that kind of velocity 
and we can actually hitch rides on them. So this kind of uh, scenario would be perfect for that. So maybe we've just turned around the argument. Maybe we can actually um, do uh, do some rendezvous missions there if we were to use this kind of tether technology. But I won't go too far on that line. It might be a bit far out there. Um, so all of these asteroids, we didn't really know that much about before we went there. So uh, we'll start with the... Sorry, I don't, don't think this one works. Oh, it does. Laser pointer works. Okay. So this first uh, asteroid that we've got here called Ida, didn't know we had a moon until very recently, until we flew past it. Second asteroid here, Mathild, uh, or Matilda, uh, didn't know how huge it was, didn't know it had such a low albedo. It's quite dark. Not as dark as our comets, but still dark. This uh, asteroid here, Tiltatus, was actually the most recent to be flown past, and it came quite close to the Earth, about five lunar distances, I think, a bit out of my range, um, but that's okay. And we didn't know it was red. The, the Chinese flew past it, and we were like, oh, it's red. And you can, you can characterize uh, some parts of the, uh, the spectrum from Earth, but we can still have these things that we don't know. Last one, Lutetia, humongous asteroid, hundreds of kilometers across. We thought it was a lot more massive than it is. It isn't. It's actually quite, uh, it, it's a lot less dense than we originally thought. We would not have known that had we not flown by that asteroid. So there's a lot of data that we can pick up doing this kind of characterization. All right, graphs. Ooh, that's scary. Okay, so first up, let's look at our guesses. So this is within one uh, lunar radius, and this was uh, pretty much two, a year before uh, two months ago. So we're looking at about 14 months to two months time period. And we knew of about 25 asteroids that passed within one lunar distance. How many are there actually? Probably hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more than that. Uh, many of them are quite small, uh, but ones that are maybe, I don't know, bigger than 50 meters, um, there's, there's probably at least 100 that pass by Earth. And we, we don't know about most of them. Isn't that scary? I think it's scary. <laughs> right. And using this kind of uh, method that I just showed on my, my previous slides, we can maybe look at uh, these kind of asteroids that are passing a little bit further. And the, the recent pumpkin slash Halloween asteroid would fit in this category here. It was uh, just 5% again past the, the lunar distance mark. And of this subset here, these are the relative sizes. So we knew of a whole bunch of 10 meter asteroids that had probably still caused some damage on Earth, um, and so on and so forth. Going back to here, I guess two notable exceptions that we did not know, know about in this uh, time period. There was a bolide that exploded above uh, Bangkok. No one saw that coming, but it was a huge fireball and lots of people saw it. Also, uh, it's, it's actually out of this time period, but there was an asteroid that exploded over, over the uh, Russian city of Chelyabinsk, and it uh, injured 1,000 people. Had no idea about it until uh, it exploded, and many people thought it was a nuclear weapon um, before <laughs> you know, everyone talked to one another and said, no, that wasn't us, wasn't us either. Maybe it was North Korea. Oh, no, it wasn't them. <laughs> it was an asteroid. And uh, yeah, we had no idea about it, so it came very close. So the scary thing is, we don't know about most of these until roughly two weeks or so beforehand. So of all of these asteroids here, we only knew of about four beforehand. And of those four, only uh, three of them we knew about only because they had gone very close to the Earth before. So we had had this kind of time period before, and now we know about the orbit, so we know they're coming past again. And that's true of many of these asteroids. They're going to actually pass by the Earth very close again. Um, so they're an interesting target that we could maybe visit a few times. Um, the last thing is that these rendezvous missions that I've shown here, I've shown the near spacecraft or Rosetta spacecraft, um, and this is showing delta V roughly from geosynchronous orbit. And these are huge in comparison to this escape velocity of the Earth system. So if we are to stay in the Earth system like we are for this solution, um, then we're saving kilometers per second of delta V. And that's, that's really fast. That's, that's the only way I can uh, kind of translate that. It's really quick, and there's a lot of energy required to make it happen. Um, so 
is it better to stay within the Earth Moon system? Well, if we only uh, care about getting uh, a very fast flyby and very uh, quick uh, details of an asteroid, then it's definitely better, I would say. Right, so uh, a lot of people had some really nice uh, Earth well, thanks, Earth well, uh, Earth uh, gravity well diagrams, which I don't have, but I do have the delta V from two different staging orbits to a whole bunch of positions in the Earth Moon system. These both go out to about three lunar distances here. That's about one there, uh, two there, and three. So we're looking at two different staging orbits. That's a 100,000 kilometer staging orbit that I was talking about. That's geosynchronous there. So we're looking uh, to get out to the lunar distance from geosynchronous orbit. We're looking at roughly one kilometer per second, delta V, which is relatively cheap. It's not cheap, but it's relatively cheap. If we go out a bit further, it's cheaper again. It's only 450 or maybe let's call it 500, square 500 meters per second delta V. Um, so the further out we go, then the uh, uh, lower the, the fuel cost would be, will be for different spacecraft heading out. But the uh, time for rotation of GEO is about one day, right? And over here it's about four days. So we might have to wait several days to get to the right orientation in our orbit. And when, we only, when we're only uh, two to three weeks out from knowing about these things, that's actually a long period of time. So maybe we wouldn't want to go out that far just for that reason. Okay, so something that's really making this possible is this new type of CubeSat propulsion. So the idea would be to have a CubeSat sized spacecraft or a very small spacecraft um, because you can get a whole bunch of great sensors on small spacecraft already. But the problem is they don't really have much propulsion. Well, people are working on that. Um, so we've got three different CubeSat engines here. Um, and these are all based on 3U CubeSats. I prefer the 3U version. Um, I can talk about that more to the mining people later if they like about the CubeSats. Um, but yeah, they've got all these uh, delta velocities that are still a bit slow, but we can actually, if we look back at our curves, depending on uh, which orbit we choose, we can actually go out a fair way still. So maybe not so much with Geo, but with this kind of 100,000 kilometer orbit, we can still get out to, I don't know, maybe uh, a third to half of the moon's distance there, which is pretty good. Um, another idea would be that to have, to uh, intercept as many asteroids as possible, maybe you'd want a mothership. And we've already got CubeSat deployers, like the one that I've shown here. This one's from Nanorax, and it's used aboard the uh, International Space Station already. Um, I'm not saying that's exactly how you would want this type of configuration, uh, but it would probably be similar. And then a mothership can have things like uh, station keeping and also communication with the Earth whilst you're uh, in that staging orbit waiting to discover an asteroid to intercept. Um, so a mothership might be a good idea and it, and it would uh, change the cost situation slightly, but uh, it might be best for risk type of reasons. All right, so there's a whole bunch of issues, all right? Sometimes uh, there isn't a lot of flight history, so none of those engines that I showed you have actually flown in space yet. They've all had great testing on Earth so far. Um, there are constraints in the sensors, so when you're going by really fast, you don't have a great opportunity uh, to take heaps of photos sometimes, so you've got to, got to think of that and maybe get that technology a bit better. Um, so yeah, Delta V, as I showed you, maybe only good enough for a, a partially effective mission but we'll see, and mothership unknown cost. But there's a great exponential growth in the use of CubeSats, and there'll probably be a lot more flight history on these kinds of solutions soon. Um, and also, uh, there's heaps more asteroids being discovered. So maybe instead of the, the lowly percent, whatever it might be that we know of at the moment that passed close to Earth, maybe we'll know of m many more in the future. Um, and also, the better we are at detecting these asteroids, the longer time we'll know about them in advance. And so maybe we can start looking at uh, electric propulsion or something along those lines. Oh, that's great. I left the picture there. That's nice. Um, do we have time for questions, perhaps? Yes. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. We have time for one or two questions. Yep. Do those three cubesat drives, one of them used hydrazine, 
yep. take the other two as secondary payloads, or are they using dangerous fuels? Oh, sorry. Um, let's go back to that slide. So the green propellant is actually not dangerous. So you could even work with that in a lab without a hazmat suit on, which I didn't mention to everyone here. Unfortunately, I think it's still under strict ITAR, but I'm not 100% of the basics there. But they're going to be uh, launching a small spacecraft with that propellant early next year in January or February, which will be really exciting. Yes? Yeah, um, so what about high specific pulse plasma? Do you yeah. have enough notice to get to this? Like, what's the option? No. Are you saying, <laughs> no, you we've got three hours, we've got to go? But no, it, it's not three hours, but uh, the amount of momentum you'd have to build up is still enough that it would take a long time. So I'm really interested, uh, Patty Newman, I'm gonna point you out. Um, people like himself are developing new engines that might be better for this kind of purpose. And I, I also know there's some other people at Sydney University who are also working on an interesting kind of bank of engines that could be very useful. And I'm really excited about what, where that's going. I think it could be a fun glamour mission to put together here with those technologies. Yeah. Oh, 100%. And, uh, you know, this, this kind of mission is actually low risk in my opinion because there's so much you could do with it. You don't have to insert the asteroid. If you miss it, you can take great shots of the Earth and then send them back or great shots of the Moon, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's shots of spy satellites. Don't tell anyone. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, there's heaps of applications and I think even if you miss the asteroid, you're going to get a great mission out of it. So I think it's low risk. Thank you, William. Okay, um, our next speakers, in fact, all of our next speakers are under.